as part of our um, fall Friday lecture series at the Center for European Studies. We're very happy to have Professor Nina Hall with us to give her talk today. I'm going to let um, Lisa, Leah, and Chloe introduce her, but just briefly, she is a professor of international relations at the um, at Johns Hopkins School called SAIS, um, which is the School of Advanced International Studies, and she is based in Bologna. All right, I'm going to turn it over to the TAM students. Yes. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth TAM lecture series of the school year and our first via Zoom, as we have an international speaker. Uh, yeah, I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Nina Hall. Maybe it's nice if you raise your hand real quick so everyone can see you. Uh, Nina Hall, Hall was born and raised in New Zealand, where she obtained her bachelor and her master's degree with honors. Uh, her research in international organization advocacy, refugee migration, and climate change brought her all over the globe as she went to Oxford for her PhD, to the Herdy School of Governance in Berlin to teach, and currently Nina Hall works at the faculty of, as a faculty affiliate for international relations at the John Hopkins School of, of Advanced International Studies in Bologna, Italy. And today her research brings her virtually to the other side of the Atlantic Ocean as she will lecture about her newest book, Transnational Advocacy in the Digital Area. Think global, act local. And when it comes to Dr. Hall's professional background, she did take a break from academics between her master's degree and the beginning of her PhD. And during that time, she worked at the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and she also did two internships. The first internship was with the UN Department of Political Affairs in New York, and the other one was with UN Social Policy Division at UNICEF in Nepal. Furthermore, she's also a co-founder of an independent think tank called Tekuaka, formerly known as New Zealand Alternative. And this think tank works for rethinking New Zealand's role in the world. They claim that within the area of foreign policy, New Zealand is missing out on a large section of the population since the group working in foreign policy is very homogenous. So they want to enhance a more progressive foreign policy and for more diverse voices to be heard in this area. Dr. Hall will not focus specifically on talking about the think tank today, but I know that if you do have questions about it, she will happily answer them at the end. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Leanne. Is it my turn or is there anyone? Okay. Uh, Chloe still has a part, but we can't okay. hear you, Chloe. Do you have earphones? Yeah. Yeah, yeah now we hear you. Good. <laughs> Okay. Um, Dr. Hall's journey to becoming a professor of international relations all started from a young age with a burgeoning interest in learning about the world, and she followed this interest to her master's degree in political studies, where she wrote a thesis about women's rights and advocacy in East Timor, and then to a PhD in international relations. Her first book, titled Displacement, Development, and Climate Change, International Organizations Moving Beyond Their Mandates, was published in 2016. She has also published numerous articles and op-eds in outlets such as the Washington Post and the Guardian. As Leah mentioned, today she will present her latest book, Transnational Advocacy in the Digital Era, Think Global, Act Local, analyzing the ways in which technology has impacted advocacy and what this could mean for transnational advocacy in the future. When Dr. Hall isn't teaching or working on research, you might find her taking part in outdoor activities, including swimming from Turkey to Greece in solidarity with refugees arriving in Europe, which she did in 2015. And with that, we're very excited to welcome Dr. Nina Hall. Fantastic. Thank you. Can you hear me all? Yes. Yes, excellent. Um, well, thank you, Leanne, Lisa, and Chloe, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's really lovely to speak to you all as part of this program. I, um, as the, the, the introduction mentioned, have taught both um, at Herty in Germany, so I'm familiar with where some of you may be heading, um, and now in Italy and in Bologna, where I'm Assistant Professor in International Relations, and just down the road from Siena, where I know at least um, Chloe will be heading. So I, I hope that you all um, really get to make the most of, of your time in Europe next year. Um, 
What I wanted to do today was to speak for about 25 minutes on my book. And then I'm very open to any questions from you. The book's just come out um, because of supply chain issues. Interestingly, uh, it's having some trouble getting over to the US, um, but it is available online uh, to purchase um, and maybe already in your library they have. If they don't, you can always ask to get an online purchase so that you can, you can read it online. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so I will see less of you, but um, please do give me a nudge, uh, anyone. Um, if you do have questions, I'm, I'm happy, to, happy to stop. Can everyone see that screen now? Yeah, great. So this is the cover. Um, now, the book is over five years of research, um, and I'm an international relations scholar, as you heard. And basically, I got really interested, uh, and as you heard already in the introduction, I've for some time been interested in activism. I've worked on women's rights in Timor. I've worked on issues around climate and refugee and development issues. But what struck me is that reading international relations scholarship, right? So political communications or, you know, sociology is a bit different. There wasn't really much written about how patterns of transnational advocacy were changing in the digital era. And this struck me as a bit odd. I think most of us today, you know, are very aware of the impact that the internet has on our lives. We're sort of almost always on it. And I decided that I wanted to unpack it a bit further. And before we go any too far though, I do want to emphasize that my talk today isn't about things that just happen online, that most protest happens to some extent online and offline today. And that's why I've got this image here of climate strikers. And actually I just came from walking through the streets of Bologna where Fridays for Future, the youth climate striking movement um, are doing global strikes today all around the world. And they were, they were up in what's known as Piazza Verdi. Now what's interesting of course, is that they mobilize offline on the streets, but they obviously use digital technology to coordinate so that you can go on their website and find a protest anywhere almost in the world today happening, be it in New Zealand, be it in uh, Germany, be it in Africa, Asia, Latin America, there's protests everywhere and they're all connected thanks to the internet. And I'm going to come back to this example at the end of my talk. So hold on to it as one example. So starting out in this research, some of the assertions that were made in the literature, particularly in the 90s and, and uh, early 2000s that I was seeing uh, was things that uh, like electronic means have made, literally made it possible to ignore borders and create the kinds of communities based on common values and objectives that were once almost the exclusive prerogative of nationalism. Now I put this up and I, and I said that I asked all this hadn't really written about transnational advocacy in the digital era and I would qualify it. They did make statements about it in the late 90s and early 2000s, but they were often hypotheses like this. They were sort of making assertions and to my view didn't really have the evidence to back it up. They were saying nation states aren't going to be important anymore. Once we have the internet, just like that climate protest we saw in the previous photo, you know, everyone everywhere will be working collectively together and nation states don't matter. And I wasn't so convinced by this um, and I'll, I'll show you why. But others, this wasn't just um, political scientists saying this, also sociologists more recently, like Manuel Castro was writing in 2012 saying, movements spread by contagion in a world networked by wireless internet, right? So the internet, we're, we're leaping forward to a different age of the internet and marked by fast viral diffusion of ideas. Um, and images and ideas. This is the kind of like Me Too, Black Lives Matter, Fridays for Future era that we can think of. You know, he's writing and saying, when there's a protest on Me Too in one place, it can virally and quickly spread. So these kinds of claims are quite widespread. Um, and as I said, I the aim of my book is to kind of unpack some of these claims empirically and to say, well, what is actually going on in terms of transnational advocacy. And by transnational, I mean across international borders. And, and, and most of you being in a, in a program, a transatlantic master's program, are familiar with the idea of connecting or spilling across borders. Now, I'm going to make two arguments today. And I'm going to draw on empirical work that I've collected, as well as literature and political communications to challenge international relations scholars of advocacy. And then the first argument, I'm going to say we've actually seen the emergence of new forms of digitally native advocacy organizations. 
And I'm going to explain what they are, but they're groups like Move On or Avaz, 350.org. And I'm going to say that they are different to most of the groups that I asked scholars have studied in the past. Groups like Oxfam, Greenpeace, um, Worldwide Fund for Nature, Transparency International, that are well known and written about. And secondly, what I'm going to point out is although these groups are digitally native, so they grew up in the digital era and they really sophisticated at using digital technology, whether it be social media, viral videos, but also digital analytics and testing, they, and they campaign on transnational issues. They campaign on things that you're interested in, like migration I've seen in some of your profiles or climate change or trade or security. They, they care about these issues but they target the nation state. So I'm gonna explain essentially, while we see a lot of connections happening, the nation state remains extremely important. So first of all, um, it's a little bit tricky for me to do this, um, but I'll bring this back up. I'm curious to know how many of you have heard of any of these organizations? Just put up your hand. Um, so I can see Jimmy, Sam. Dale, Sarah, Sam, which one have you heard of just out of curiosity? Um, move on in US. Yeah. What about you, Jimmy? Compact in Germany. Oh, cool. So you're from Germany, I'm guessing? Well, I don't know, Sam and Jimmy, if you knew this, but those two organizations are related. Um, so move on for those of you who aren't familiar it was the first organization to be created in 1998 of this group and what was special about it is that it was one of the early groups to pioneer online petitions so collecting people's emails to petition on anything from climate to uh, things like the Iraq war they actually became really big in the Iraq war and what's important wasn't just that they're doing something online is that they kept people's email addresses. So you sign up for one campaign, say on stopping Iraq war in the early 2000s, and then on a subsequent campaign, Move On has a whole list. Their resources become people who've signed up to their email and they can mobilize. It's a progressive group. Um, and what's fascinating for me is that it had a big impact on American political advocacy. And in fact, David Karp, this is the book on the left, um, writes a book called The Move On Effect, The Unexpected Transformation of American Political Advocacy, thanks to Move On's work. And political communication scholars, in fact, have written quite a lot about the impact of Move On's sister organizations, groups that emulated Move On around the world. So we know Get Up in Australia has had a big impact on Australian elections. We know 38 Degrees in the UK has had a big impact on uh, various progressive issues. Campact in Germany on trade, as I'll talk about. But none of these organizations have previously been connected in the academic literature, but they're all part of the same family. They all follow the same model, which I'll flesh out. So a big part of my book is saying to the political communication scholarship, we know these groups are powerful, but what's fascinating is that it's the same model that's spread across the world of being member-driven, rapid response, using digital analytics to survey your members and figure out what they care about. And what I'm saying to the international relations literature is, you guys don't know these, these organizations. So typically if I present to an audience of international relations scholars, most of people in the room haven't heard about them. And that's because they're seen as nationally focused groups. They haven't seen to have transnational effect. And as you're well familiar with, I think from your political science background, Understanding the distinction between local, national, regional, international is important, but we know increasingly how those are interrelated. So I think these groups are really important to study. I think they're important to study by IR scholars because they're a global phenomenon. They exist in over 19 countries worldwide, and we can talk a little bit in Q&A where and why they exist in some countries, but not in others, like China. They're all in democracies. Um, they claim one in 15 domestic voters as their members. So members are people who have signed up to an email, like I want to campaign against the Iraq war or I want to stop a particular trade agreement. And they claim overall then more than 20 million members or supporters. So they have a very large membership that they can mobilize very rapidly because they can contact them on email. 
But it's not just about this latent resource. It's not just saying, oh, you know, they can like mobilize people to sign petitions. They also mobilize people offline and at really important critical moments. And for those of you who are interested, as I noted, a lot of you are in European politics, they have had crucial impacts on political debate and potentially even policy outcomes in very significant uh, moments. So here, I was actually living at Berlin at the time during the TTIP debate, which is the Transatlantic Trade and Intellectual Property Agreement between the EU and the US. Um, and a number of uh, people were very concerned by this agreement. And CAMPAC was one of many organizations, but a key organization that brought protesters together for one of the biggest protests in Germany since the Iraq war. It was about a quarter of a million people were the estimates in um, Berlin and the Brandenburg. Uh, this is around the Brandenburg Gate. You can't even see the Brandenburg Gate because it was so cool. Um, and in the book, I look more at the role of CAMPACT in campaigning, not just against TTIP, but CETA, um, the Japanese uh, European FTA, and Mercosur, and kind of trace how they were able to, to shape public opinion. Um, and this was acknowledged by conservative actors. So it's not just, I don't just quote Kempak saying, oh, we were really important with what we did. Actually, I've talked um, with people who wanted the trade agreements to go through and found Kempak on the other side um, to be a force to be reckoned with. And it's not just trade politics. I think in Poland, Aksha Demokracja, which is, again, it's the move on, and they're all independent organizations, I should note, and they all have progressive values. Um, they have been very important uh, in the pro-democracy movement, and some of you who are familiar with, with Polish politics will know in the past, um, there was a big debate about uh, the, the government interfering in, in the judiciary and essentially getting the judiciary to resign early, and Aksha Demokracja was involved in mobilizing uh, people to uh, take to the streets to protest against this action. So why am I stressing this? I'm stressing this because sometimes people come at me and go, oh, digital activism is just slacktivism. You know, it's just people doing things that are like easy, you know, changing their Facebook profile or putting something on Twitter. I'm not talking simply about things that happen online. I'm talking about groups that are savvy and can use the internet to mobilize people online and offline. And for me, the interesting questions today in activism is, how do those things interconnect? How do groups know how to use internet platforms to then make a big impact offline as well? Are there any questions or anything before I go further? No? All right. So what did I do? How did I study um, this group of digital advocacy organizations? Well, when I started studying, um, I realized that they were part of a network. And that network's called Open. Um, and here is a photo you can see. Um, I'm in there uh, somewhere in, in the back, right in the middle, in the blue. Um, and I basically got access to their summits, to their meetings, where members of each of these independent organizations, CAMPAT, Move On, 38 Degrees in the UK, Action Station from New Zealand, would meet on a regular basis to share ideas about campaigning to share ideas about technology, um, tactics and operations. Uh, and I interviewed them. So I did both participant observation um, and I did over a hundred interviews with people. I also traveled to um, more than half a dozen countries from Australia to Poland to meet and talk and see how they do their activism. And I think this is an important thing to note because often studies of activism online base on what they can see on public websites. However, I think that's really limited because you don't actually see how campaign decision-making is done. So one of the advantages of my study is I've gone behind the websites to actually talk with the people and understand how they're making their decisions and what they share and why um, they share what they do. Um, I've also got a data set, which I will refer to of, of campaigning um, actions that they've taken. So here's my challenge to the IR literature. I'm gonna speak through my first argument. I'm gonna make the argument that these organizations not, are not always powerful, but they can be powerful and their source of power is very distinct from the way IR scholars have conventionally thought about advocacy and NGOs. And that's because there are four things these groups do differently. The first is they engage in elections very actively. So when we typically think of Greenpeace or even Fridays for Future, um, uh, 
that I was just down in the square in Italy seeing Fridays for Future, for instance, is not taking a stance on who people should vote for in the election on Sunday in Italy. So there's a protest happening just a couple of hundred meters away from me of climate activists, and they're not making any stance. They're apolitical. That's typical of Greenpeace. It's typical of Oxfam. Why? Because they want to work with whoever wins. Their position is often also for charity status rules. They can't interfere politically. They can't campaign overtly. This is something that's quite common in most NGOs. And in fact, it's very rare. I've never seen a study of in international relations of advocacy actors and how they, you know, NGOs get involved in political elections. The groups I study are very different. They campaign extremely actively in a lot of elections. Um, so I've got a couple of examples here. Move On held the very first primary debate between uh, the Democrats. And I should note here, all the groups I study are progressive. So they're going for progressive uh, candidates. Um, and move on then, you know, back the eventual uh, Democratic uh, candidate and would work very hard to get, get out the vote. And that's, move on, has a long history of engaging in, in, in election campaigns. Um, and they'll use conventional tactics like going door to door knocking, canvassing, telephone, you know, voting. But what makes it, uh, I guess, a bit more sophisticated is that they can use digital analytics to go, which street should we door knock on? Which is the particular area we need to focus on? And of course, you know, the Democrats and Republicans have been doing this, but in some countries, there's been less of this kind of sophisticated ca um, campaigning during election time. And the groups that I study are often amongst um, the groups that are doing this uh, in the most sophisticated way. So in Australia, to give you another example, um, Get Up campaigned very, very strong um, against the Conservative government and for uh, progressive candidates. And um, back in, in uh, the election in 2019, um, they campaigned to get um, Tony Abbott out of his seat. He was no longer then the Prime Minister. He just um, had been forced to resign, but, and they managed to unseat him. Um, and they're so effective that they get attacked regularly by the Murdoch press. Um, and they've actually had one of the highest political expenditures of the 25 organizations which make declarations to the Australian Electoral Commission. So we're talking, you know, around 12 million, which in US terms might sound small, but um, in Australian terms is quite significant. And Abbott actually acknowledged, this is the former prime minister, their impact saying there's no doubt that get up and the green left put massive resources into the seat, which he eventually lost. So this is really important to note that they campaign when politicians are at their most vulnerable, right? And they do that purposefully because they want politicians to be held to account. And they have a large membership, people in this orange t-shirts um, down below, who, who are volunteers for these organizations. The other elements really fit together in, in this model of digital advocacy organization I wanna talk about. And that's that their rapid response. And this is probably no surprise to you when you operate on the internet, you can do things really quickly, right? You can send off an email, start an online petition um, very promptly from one day to the next. And I've seen that in my ethnographic research. Now, this contrasts to groups when we think of Oxfam or Greenpeace that have a long-term commitment to a cause. So most IR scholarship assumes that people like norm entrepreneurs really care about climate change and they're not going to just start a campaign on climate one day and then shift to something else the next. And this is, in fact, what the groups I do, uh, what the groups that I study do. They're multi-issue generalists. They don't have one specific issue expertise, right? So they might campaign on climate change on Monday because it's seen as important. And then the Ukraine war and helping Ukrainian refugees is more important the second day. And then on the Wednesday, there's a, another issue again. So they're switching according to what they think their members are the most important. And this is the third element that I have here that's really important that they're member driven. So they're driven by what issues their members think are most important important and they can identify this through surveying they can identify it through digital analytics so they'll see did you open that email about the climate protest on friday oh you didn't okay well then we'll try sending you a different email with the subject line written in a different way instead of just focusing on climate we might say justice and maybe you're more triggered by the word justice so they'll do a b testing to identify which subject line will get the most interest 
Um, and they'll also monitor how many people actually open the email, how many people take the action and follow through. And what that means is that they have a huge amount of data by which they can make their campaigning decisions. Now, typically Oxfam and Greenpeace wouldn't do that, right? They wouldn't say, okay, we have a campaign to say, you know, Ukrainian refugees, but we also have one for like Eritreans and one for what's happening in Yemen. And then let's run a survey and see, you know, who cares about Yemen, who cares about Ukraine, and then we'll run the top one. Like that's not how most human rights campaigning work and rightly so. So my interest is, is in this very distinct model, right? It's, it's very different from the way that NGOs work and it's enabled by the digital era, but it's not solely defined by the fact that it's online, right? These features are, are being rapid response, being multi-issue, being member-driven and using digital analytics are all facilitated by digital um, technologies. And that's where I get to the point that they have a degree of digitally networked power. They can mobilize people really quickly because they're relying on, on this, this, this form, this organizational model. And so in the book, for instance, I give the example of some of the refugee campaigns that groups like 38 Degrees move on um, and others run. This is just one example. Um, in the aftermath of, of uh, well, in the summer of 2015, when there were increasing number of refugees uh, arriving into Europe, there was a outroar that European governments weren't doing enough. And there was a lot of public pressure put on European governments to open their doors and welcome more refugees. And groups like 38 Degrees could quickly set up a website, even though they weren't campaigning on refugee issues previously, and then facilitate their members, over a million in the UK, and encourage them to sign up and say, we want more refugees. In this case, it was focused on a particular um, city. Now, in the book, I don't make a claim of attribution. I don't say that because of their work, David Cameron changed his position, but I say it was part of a contribution to a broader social movement and pressure to increase uh, the refugee intake in the UK. And David Cameron did decide to do that. But what's interesting, now so far maybe you sound, you might be thinking, oh, you know, Nina just thinks these organizations are the best, they can do everything, you know, we, you know, everyone should be doing what they're doing. And that's certainly not the case. In the book, I set out this model and say, here's the strengths, it's rapid. It's, you know, multi-issue, it can quickly pivot, but there are limitations to the model. So when I visited 38 Degrees, which is based in London with permanent staff who were running this campaign I just showed, several months after the 2015 crisis, it was early 2016, their focus had shifted to other things. Brexit was a big one, but also saving the bees. Now, why? because the polls that they were doing on their members, refugees wasn't a big issue anymore. Even though at that time as a policy issue, there were still big problems with children left in Calais on the right on the, the uh, French side of the English Channel, who uh, refugee experts were trying to get across and to get access to the UK. But the organization's members, the people on their email lists, were more concerned about the bees than they were about the refugees. Now, my point here is not to say bees aren't also important, which they are. It's to say the way that people's attention span changes, obviously one or two weeks, you might be concerned about refugees when it's on the headlines, but people's interest often fades. So one of the limitations of the model of being so member driven is that it's rapid and reactive, and it just responds to what their members care about. It doesn't try and transform them. You're just being polling people or you're just seeing what they open and what they click. You're not actually trying to change their underlying preferences. So they have a tendency in this purely member-driven logic to run popular campaigns, and it's much harder to campaign for minority rights, things like refugee issues or indigenous rights issues. And in the final chapter of the book, I actually look at how this model has evolved over time. So what I set out at the beginning of the presentation of being member-driven, rapid response, um, multi-issue is still true, but a lot of the organizations have realized that they can fall into somewhat of a, basically a populist trap, that they aren't necessarily always campaigning for 
really hard issues that some in the progressive uh, circles want them to be campaigning for because there isn't enough support amongst their membership. And so that staff actually have to take more of a guiding role to try and transform the preferences and run sustained campaigns, even when they aren't getting sufficient member support um, on things like refugee rights and Get Up, uh, which Get Up has done in Australia and Action Station on Indigenous or Māori rights in New Zealand. So Get Up has, uh, which is the sister organization of Move On, run uh, campaigns to try and get all of the refugees out of detention in Australia. And I can speak more to that. Before um, I wind up, I do want to just spend the next and last sort of four or five minutes just talking about the transnational dimension. Because the first part of my presentation, I've basically tried to argue these groups are A, powerful, and they can shape public opinion. And secondly, they have a very distinctive source of power from most of the NGOs which IR scholars have typically studied. studied right? Now you might be saying, well, what's the sort of transnational element amongst them? Well, what's interesting is that these separate organizations that exist in the US, Canada, Poland, Hungary, Israel, South Africa, and over 20 countries worldwide have formed an international or transnational network. And they're united by common values, so they are all progressive, but mostly they're united by this common model. They all see that their theory of change, as it's called, their way of trying to affect change in the world is this, this digital advocacy model that I've described in the first half of my presentation. And they're not united around a, a, a single or particular norm. And that's quite different for IR because most of the time IR scholars think about transnational advocacy networks being around climate or gender or women's rights. So it's a different form of network. But they have high trust amongst them and they share tactics and tech and even funding. This network has seed funded organizations elsewhere. So they've gone out and looked for an organization in France, because France is seen, as many of you will know, studying European politics as a critical player in Europe. And while there's a strong German organization, Kempat, and a strong British organization, the British and German organization is going to have a strong French organization. So we are going to go and find somebody to set that up. And they've actually interviewed, given money to try and set up an equivalent organization that's independent. So it's not run by the German or British counterparts, but run by French, the French. So in the book, I look at the spread of this model. Um, and then I ask the question of, okay, remember back to those first quotes where we, we saw sociologists and IR scholars in the late 90s and early 2000s saying, well, with the internet, everything is going to be transnationalized, right? Because obviously borders aren't going to be important anymore. Um, we're going to see global civil society emerge. And so I said, I'm going to collect data to identify how often do we see these groups campaign on transnational issues and how often do they target international institutions? I also ask in the book, and so, you know, you can go on and read, how often do they work with transnational partners? So I break down different elements of transnational advocacy. And here's briefly what I find. Firstly, they do campaign a lot on transnational issues. Um, roughly half, uh, just over half are domestic. So that's purely like uh, the National Health Service in the UK or saving a library or saving, you know, a beach from development. Um, but issues like climate, refugees, trade, conflict do come up very frequently. And Brexit's obviously a bit of a tricky character given the nature of um, that decision in British politics. So I, I code that differently. There's an example of the kind of um, online action that they would take that in my study was coded as transnational. This is CAMPAC, the German organization, campaigning against the Mercosur trade agreement, arguing to, we need to save the Amazon and that the Mercosur, in their view, was going to, going to um, risk, and, 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 uh, risk the Amazon. So that's the first part. We know that while they're nationally focused, that they're set up in different countries, uh, they do campaign on transnational issues regularly. But what I also found really interesting, even though they're all digital activists, they cooperate in this international network, they care about climate change and refugees, 
and trade international issues, they almost exclusively target a domestic actor. What I mean here by a domestic actor is a government or a minister quite often. It can be at a more regional or state level, but typically it will be a minister in charge. So this data here is the same 150 campaign actions, which we coded over a one year period, collected for four different uh, organizations, 38 degrees in the UK, Campact in Germany, Action Station New Zealand, Get Up in Australia. And as you can see, Almost, you know, there's only a couple of actions in Campac's case and one in 38 degrees where the target wasn't domestic. So it's well over 90% um, of campaigns overall had a domestic target. Now, why is this? If they frequently campaign on transnational issues, but they really target an international institution. And that's because their theory of change, the way they get power is mobilizing citizens to put pressure on democratically elected decision makers, to put pressure on people that should be accountable to them. This, this circles back to the whole point of them putting pressure on people during election campaigns. And they see the nation state as the locus of power. So even though these activists are transnationally connected and they put energy into, into, in, into, into this transnational uh, network, they recognize that the nation state on issues of trade or climate still has the most uh, power. And I want to leave you, though, with a bit of a sense of what this all means, because I think while uh, protest today is happening, it is facilitated by digital means, um, one of the really sophisticated things I think about it is that you can coordinate multiple national, local actions, but be part of a global movement, and that that's actually where the power comes from. And in the book, in one of the chapters, I talk specifically about climate protests as digitally distributed actions, where actions occur at the same time, so like today, on the same issue, climate change, but targeting national actors. So the climate protesters down in, in um, Piazza Verdi in Bologna, just which I walked through, are all focused on the Italian context, just like the ones in the US would be on the US, politicians in the lead up to midterms and ever, wherever else. And this actually dates back to previous protests by 350.org that the groups that I study were all part of. So in conclusion, um, the book makes a case that we should look at digital advocacy organizations, we should understand their influence, which comes from being member-driven, rapid response and multi-issue, but not from expertise. They rely on member support to campaign, and there's a question about how much they can shape members, shape members' preferences, and they globally network but target national actors. Um, I will note that I'm doing some research now on how the right is emulating it, because that's often a question that comes up, and I'm, I'm happy to chat further about that in the Q&A. Thanks.